what makes a Khalifa legitimate in the deen. So first I want to look at what the Quran and the Hadith tell us about the nature of Khalifa in general. So whenever we see the word Khalifa or variant forms of it in the Quran, it's always in the context of divine appointment. Uh, for example, in Surah 24 verse 55, Allah says that Allah has promised those of you who believe and do righteous deeds that he will make you Khulafa in the land, even as he made those who were before them Khulafa. In Surah 2 verse 247, he says, and the Prophet said to them, indeed Allah has appointed Talut as a king over you. In Surah 2 verse 30, he says, and mention when your Lord said to the angels, indeed I will make upon the earth a Khalifa. Verse 38, 26, he says, O Dawood, behold, we have made you a prophet and a Khalifa on the earth. So in all of these cases, whenever you see the word Khalifa in the Quran, it's always in the context of divine appointment. So there's nothing to indicate definitionally, uh, definitionally that a Khalifa can be anything other than a divinely appointed leader. So since the established precedent based on the Quran is that the Khalifa is someone who is appointed by Allah, for us to believe that a Khalifa can be anyone other than one appointed by Allah requires us to have revelation explicitly confirming this. And Allah says in Surah 33 verse 62, such is the sunnah of Allah concerning those who passed away before and never shall you find in the custom of Allah any change. So as it's Allah's custom to appoint Khulafa, what we find in the hadith of both the Shia and the Sunni is that the Khalafa is considered a part of the deen. Because we find that the Prophet ﷺ himself is quoted as having ordained obedience to the Khalifa. So in Sayyid Bukhari 7.137 he says, and whoever obeys my Amir obeys me, and whoever disobeys him disobeys me. And the Quran itself also makes this comparison in Surah 4 verse 59 where it says, Ya ayyuhalladheen amanu wa atiya Allah wa atiya rasoola wa alil amri minkum. O you have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. Since the Khilafat is a part of Islam, and Islam is a holistic religion encompassing all the different aspects of life from the mundane to the spiritual to the political, uh, Rasulullah has explained to us all of these different matters uh, as he was obligated to explain every single religious matter by Allah. Uh, like Allah says in Surah 16 verse 89, we have sent down to you the book explaining all things, a guide, a mercy, and glad tidings to the Muslims. So there is no part of the religion that Rasulullah has neglected to explain in detail to the Muslims. Yet according to the Sunni belief, he never described how the leader is to be chosen before he departed. And that's why a national consensus, small shura, appointment, even taking it by force are all considered to be legitimate forms of becoming the Khalifa. How can the Messenger of Allah leave us without fulfilling his duty of explaining to us the rules of religion, including the nature of Khalifa, and what makes someone the Khalifa to whom obedience is obligatory. So we find in Sahih Muslim 1, uh, 1823b that Abdullah ibn Omar is quoted as advising, as advising his father, saying they presume that you are not going to nominate a successor. If a grazer of camels and sheep that you had appointed comes back to you leaving the cattle, you will certainly think that the cattle are lost. To look after the people is more serious and grave. So here Ibn Omar is realizing the gravity of leaving people directionless without a leader. Right? So how can we say that Rasulullah neglected this responsibility? So the Sunnis will often claim that the issue of Khalafa was left to the Muslims to settle by Shura among themselves. Rather than viewing the method in which Abu Bakr was uh, quote unquote elected as a model for future Khalafa to be chosen, uh, Omar describes it in Sayyid Bukhari 6, 8, 30 as a falta or a hasty decision taken without judgment or foresight, one from which Allah saved the people of its evil. And Abu Bakr himself did not follow this method when appointing his own successor since he appointed Omar directly in his will. So one cannot say that Khilafah is a religious institution but how the Khalifa is chosen isn't a part of the religion because that's like saying that wudu is a part of the religion but how to do wudu is not, was not told to us and was just left to the companions to figure out themselves. So how can it be obligatory for us to obey the Khalifa and give him bay'ah if we don't even know who the Khalifa is in the eyes of Allah? Um, the Khilafah of Abu, Bakr, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, is a political issue. Their rafd in and of itself does not constitute kufr, meaning that one can still be a Muslim and reject the legitimacy of the caliphate. My position is that the roles and responsibilities and the scope of the office of Khalifa is outlined in Quran and Sunnah. I do not believe that the specific medium of appointment is specified in the Quran and Sunnah. Therefore, the Muslims are free to appoint the Khalifa by whatever means they wish, subject to a broad set of constraints derived from the example of those who lived 
with the Prophet To this end, I invoke the principle in Sharia, which is that everything is permissible until proven to be haram. I challenge my opponent as follows, and this is my primary argument. Bring from Quran and Sunnah a divine command to this ummah regarding the method by which a khalifa should be show, uh, chosen and derive from this a set of constraints. This is number one. Number two, prove using authentic narrations your rendition of how Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was uh, elected. Number three, show how your proven rendition by which Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was elected violates the constraints derived from Quran and Sunnah. My argument, my primary argument is simply that your inability to do so proves the legitimacy of the khilaf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Exhibit B uh, states that Ali says that the Prophet did not entrust upon us any covenant concerning Al-Imama, uh, however, it is something he lets us see ourselves. Here. So according to Ali radiallahu an, it doesn't matter what Silverado says about it being nonsensical, but you know, how can the Prophet sallallahu leave us without telling him this? Because is, Ali radiallahu an is saying that my imam is saying that I'm going to take his word for it. Uh, exhibit C, Aisha radiallahu anha says that the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi called Abu Bakr radiallahu an and indicated to, uh, to some extent. Again, I do not believe that Abu Bakr radiallahu was appointed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi but he gave some indication that uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu was um, to be in a position of, of some authority after uh, his passing. Furthermore, I present to you Exhibit D, uh, which although does not directly address the issue of Khilafa, certainly does lend credibility to the notion that Abu Bakr was left in a position of authority in the absence of the Prophet Wasallam. right? This is the infamous narration, or famous narration of um, a, a woman being told by the Prophet Wasallam, if you do not find me, then come to Abu Bakr. Uh, an early Rafidi source uh, which proves that Abu, uh, Ali radiallahu anh, did in fact give bay'ah to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. Exhibit J, Hassan Hadith, and the Sunni corpus showing the same. Exhibit P and Exhibit O. Um, so this, the, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, uh, received bay'ah from literally everyone. Um, I would like to ask my opponent if he believes that Abu, everyone in Medina gave bay'ah to someone illegitimately. If my opponent knows the means by which Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, was able to coerce every single person in Medina to give bay'ah despite his illegitimacy, I implore him to give Donald Trump a call as I'm sure he would be very interested in learning how one might be able to coerce people into giving him allegiance despite the illegitimacy of his claims to have won the 2020 elections. And you find Ibn Taymiyyah saying in Aqid al wastia uh, that Whoever the ch challenges the Khilafah of any one of these caliphs is more misguided than his household donkey. What this shows is that it is a matter of religion. It is not something outside of the religion. And it cannot be something outside of the religion when, as I've shown, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, gave all of these hadith which uh, are relating to the Khalifa, the necessity of obeying the Khalifa, uh, how the Khalifa's obedience is similar to the obedience of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. So all of these show that actually the Khalifa is a position of religious authority as well as political authority. So therefore, we need some religious guidance on who the Khalifa is. Uh, you said everything is permissible until proven haram. Does that mean that Rasulullah is exempt from literally explaining like the details of religion? So what you're saying is that he's t totally exempt from speaking about the Khalifa. He just says that Khalifa exists. Hadith where Rasulullah allegedly says to go to Abu Bakr after him. Uh, this clearly does not <coughs> have anything to do with uh, nomination as you yourself conceded because in another hadith, Sahih Muslim 2385, uh, it says, I heard Aisha is, is saying, and she was asked as to whom Allah's messenger would have nominated as his successor if he had to nominate one at all. Uh, meaning that he did not nominate one, but if he had nominated one, she said it would have been Abu Bakr. Now, nowhere uh, does do the do the ayat that you referenced uh, mention that Allah commands to you who to appoint. You know, at, at, in such and such nas from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's upon you to give that person bayat. What Allah says is something to the effect of to mulk mimman tasha. Right? Allah gives uh, dominion to whom He pleases, and waistakhlifanum fil ard. Like many many ayahs reference this, right? Uh, this idea that the person who Allah gives uh, bay'a to, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, what ayat billah, the person who Allah um, chooses to give power to, is the person who ultimately becomes a khalifa, and nobody becomes khalifa without his will. So in that sense, everyone who is in power has been appointed by Allah. The the Shia version, where Allah, you know, kind of in this weird way appoints somebody who come, uh, you know, t sorry, tells the people who to appoint via nas. And then the people have to go and give that person bay'ah, and if they don't give him bay'ah, they're sinful. And then that person comes around, that person who we're supposed to give bay'ah to comes around and does taqiyah and actually gives bay'ah to the wrong person. That, that's, that's nowhere to be found in the, uh, in the Qur'an. Bring from the Qur'an and Sunnah 
a divine command to this ummah regarding the method by which we should choose a khalifa and derive from this a set of constraints. That 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 that's not that's not what you, the ayahs you referenced did not did not do that. They did not specify a medium uh, by which a khalifa is chosen. It just says that Allah is the one who gives dominion to whom He pleases. How can He how can He sallallahu alaihi wasallam leave us without telling us who the successor is? Again, if it doesn't make sense to you, it, it, that 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 really isn't um, my primary concern because it did make sense to. Ali ibn Abi Talib. So inshallah, if you could give me a response to why Ali radiallahu uh, anh was of the opinion that nobody was uh, elected. And this answer to that is basically Ballagha Risala. He gave, he completed the message to the people and he left it to the Sahaba who, you know, were righteous people as a as a generation to elect uh, whom, whom they deemed uh, necessary. I, I just want to emphasize the overwhelming nature of or the comprehensive nature of in which those who were allegedly appointed actually gave bayat to Abu Bakr or recognized the legitimacy of his khilaf. Umar claimed that uh, nowhere, uh, that uh, Allah appointing someone directly is nowhere to be found in the Quran. And whenever the Quran says that Allah has appointed someone, it just means that he basically approves of their coming into power. This is actually directly contradicted by the Quran in the example of the appointment of Balut, in which yeah, it explicitly says that it was the prophet, prophet Samuel, who directly appoints Alud. So this is the, uh, and again, we also find in the example of uh, Prophet Harun Islam being appointed the Khalifa of Prophet Musa Islam. Again, it's directly Prophet Musa Islam who appoints him as the Khalifa. So there is a Quranic method of the Khalifa being chosen, which is appointment by the prophet of the time. And this has occurred, as I mentioned previously, in the Qadir, which Omar himself conceded uh, is a very strong case for the successorship that he would have accepted had it been Abu Bakr. Um, why Imam Ali Islam claimed that Rasulullah Islam had not appointed anyone? Why the, he said that uh, Abu Bakr was better? So, if again, from Omar's perspective, he is saying that this is his Imam and he takes what his Imam says. But according to his uh, worldview, what Imam Ali Islam says and does is not binding because other other Sahaba like uh, Saad ibn Ubadah did not give a bayat to Abu Bakr and died without giving him bayat. So did Saad ibn Ubadah die the death of Jahiliyyah and did Sayyidah Fatima Ali Islam die the death of Jahiliyyah because they didn't give bayat to the, the Khalifa of the time? And is obeying the Khalifa a matter of religion or not? And if it is, then how are we supposed to know who the Khalifa is? What is the determining criteria of who makes someone a Khalifa? And he said that uh, Rasulullah left this matter to the Sahaba. So I want to ask him if it's possible for the Prophet to leave a matter of religion to the Sahaba without explaining it. You're just saying that the Sahaba can determine uh, matters of religion by themselves. So they're given legislative authority by Allah, which obviously is not the Sunni belief. Um, I also mentioned the opinions of uh, the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah. And there are many other Sunni scholars who basically uh, hold the view that disbelieving in the Khalafa of, of, of the Rashidun Khalafat, at the very least, make someone a Mubtada. And the general Sunni understanding is that this is a matter of religion. Saying that it is not a matter of religion and it's totally irrelevant and you can deny Abu Bakr and be fine, would be a heretical belief from, from uh, a Sunni perspective. My opponent says that the, the example, the Quranic method of appointment is, is divine appointment, wherein Allah kind of reveals the identity of the successor and, the, and and we all have to give bayat to that person. Uh, again, that, that's not the method that's always been used throughout the Quran. And the primary way in which Allah refers to Khilafah, Imam, and general leadership is that Allah is the one who ultimately um, gives dominion to those people, not you know tell reveal to the people who they should give bayat to. That was given in one example, right, with the example of Talut. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that that method applies to this Ummah. Um, again, there's other, you know, fiqh or examples that uh, of stuff that was given to the Jews and, and previous uh, genera- uh, peoples that uh, Allah gives in the Quran that do not apply to us. Uh, that did, did Fatima radiallahu anha uh, die a death of jahiliya wa la'iyyatu billah? If he looks at Exhibit T, which I'll send again just for his convenience, inshallah, we see that Fatima radiallahu anha did uh, give Abu Bakr Siddiq 
bay'ah she said ya khalifa rasulullah which is a confirmation of his you know position but but even if she didn't right bay'ah is not for women to to give uh it's, it's for the men and we know that all of the the men did in fact give bay'ah and that was shown in various evidences i think i think it's some from tarikh al-tabari yeah exhibit o exhibit p uh, arguments my phone says that even if the imam ali radiallahu anhu did give bay'ah that does not secure his legitimacy well yes it does if the person like there's a famous uh i think saying from uh sultan muhammad um when his uh the conqueror of constantinople when his father abdicated and gave him uh what's it called uh he gave him uh the sultanate um he says that if you are the sultan it was a time of war right he says if you are the sultan then i command you to come and take lead of your army but if i'm the sultan then my command to you is that you come and you take over right so if the basically the principle is if ali radhiallahu is the imam whose obedience is obligatory for him to then pass the buck or pass the imama to somebody else that would thus secure their legitimacy because we have to follow the leader so the he cites the the famous hadith um uh, or athar of Umar bin Khattab radhiyallahu anhu referring to the incident at Saqifa as a falta the reason why it was a falta they weren't planning on you know waging war or like usurping the caliphate or anything like that but because of the urgency of the situation that they were about to elect somebody else um he ended up giving bay'ah to Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu without consulting Ali radhiyallahu anhu this actually proves his honesty right he was saying that it was a falta basically something that happened that wasn't planned is what he was referring to uh, my first question to you would be, you mentioned that um, that the way that Talut was appointed is not the way Allah always does it in the Quran. So can you give an example otherwise? Yeah, it's not uh, always. Um, I would have to, uh, can we come back to that inshallah? Maybe we get to that at the end. I don't have the exact reference on hand, but inshallah we'll try to make sure I get to that. Okay. And you mentioned that um, everybody did give a bay'ah and you uh, quoted Tariq al-Tabri. But if you look at what Tariq al-Tabri says regarding Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah says, I swear by Allah, even if the jinn gathered to you with the people, I would not render, render the oath of allegiance to you until I am brought forth before my God and I know what my reckoning is. Abu Bakr was informed of this. Omar said to him, pester him until he renders the oath of allegiance. Continued thus until Abu Bakr died. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll correct my statement. Everyone except for Sa'ad ibn Ar- all the males except for, all the free males except for Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Uh, did did, did he that Jahiliya if he didn't give bay'ah? Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> okay. If there's two claimants to the Khalafa, how do we know which one is the Khalifa in the eyes of Allah? Uh, well, we can do a post hoc rationalization about that because Allah says that uh, Allah is the one who ends up giving um, them successorship over the earth. Um, and so the one who ultimately wins is the one who Allah chose. But the hadith says and bay'ah has been given to two caliphs, kill the second. Uh, Sayyid Muslim 1853. So uh, let's say with the case of Abdullah ibn Zubair, was it uh, obligatory uh, for the people of the time to kill him? Uh, no. And, uh, according to this hadith. Because he was given bay'ah after Yazid? Or sorry, who was the... Uh, 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 Marwan. So because he was given bay'ah after Marwan, your argument is that Abdullah ibn Zubayr was... Uh, yeah, in, with the issue of Marwan ibn al-Hakam, if, if, the, if the first ruler is a, is a fasiq, then I, I do not believe that it, he counts as the, the person... For whom the the but your hadith say otherwise because your hadith say that even if the ruler um you know whips your backs and usurps your wealth you still have to give him allegiance and still yeah. have to Marwan so, Abdul Hakim a lot more than just uh whipping people's backs and usurping wealth but he won I mean he, he him and his children uh won I mean they killed Abdullah ibn Zubair so according to your previous rationalization of post hoc that means that Allah wanted Marwan ibn al Hakam and his dynasty to rule rather than Abdullah Indeed. ibn Zubair Indeed, yes. So, so now you're saying that Marwan ibn al-Hakam was the Khalifa appointed by Allah, whereas just previously you said he was a Fasiq and Abdullah ibn Zubair therefore was not required to give him bay'ah. Okay, so Marwan ibn, okay, so when it comes to uh, this issue of divine appointment, I, what I say is that 
Allah is the one who gives dominion. In that particular instance, Allah chose to give dom dominion to uh, a fasiq. So, was it then obligatory on Abdullah ibn Zubair to give him bayah? No, because he was a fasiq and he was not a legitimate. Uh, he was not. You're contrad. You're saying that he was the legitimate Khalifa in the eyes of Allah, but then you're saying it's not obligatory on him to give bayah because he wasn't the legitimate Khalifa because he was a fasiq. Does that reconcile? I see what you're saying. Um, from the ishtihad perspective of Abdullah ibn Zubair, who, anhu, who was much more worthy of the Khilafah, he did not see Marwan ibn Hakim as the person uh, who was um, to be given the Khilafah. As I said, it's a post hoc rationalization. So until Marwan ibn Hakim actually did win over Abdullah ibn Zubair, his, the fact that he was chosen was not made apparent to the people at large. You have to remember that at that time, they didn't have internet, right? So it's not like, you know, information traveled at the speed of light or close to it. Um, at the time that Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anh started uh, receiving the bay'ah, it was not uh, clear that Marwan ibn al-Hakam had already received unanimous bay'ah from, from the people, or the majority of bay'ah from the people. So your position is, uh, what makes a Khalifa legitimate is, what, receiving bay'ah from the majority of people? No, actually, that's not. That's not. Uh, what is the criteria that makes a Khalifa legitimate? Is as long as the bay'ah is obtained in a way that is within the parameters outlined in Quran and authentic Sunnah. So there's, there's, there's a lot of freedom. There's not the one exactly. Bay'ah first. I'm sorry. Is it the person who's given bay'ah first? Uh, not necessarily in every uh, case. If there's multiple people who are given bay'ah, who are we supposed to give bay'ah to? If there's the person who you believe to be okay. using your istihad, who you believe to be the more authentic one, or the more the one with the more legitimate claims to khilafa. What you just said, the legitimate claim comes from being given bayah. So how does who is the one with the more legitimate claim in that case? If all of them have been given bayah by different people, how are you supposed to use ijtihad to determine which of them is more legitimate? Right, so only Allah knows what's in the hearts, but you give bay'ah to the one who you believe is better in deen, more knowledgeable, more adil, more uh, upright. So where are you basing this off of that the Khalifa has to be the one who is the, the best in deen and the best in uh, adil and all these things? Because that's not the impression that your hadith give, right? They say that uh, the Khalifa can be an oppressor or whatever. So. Okay. That that's how the Imam of Salah is uh, elected, and so that's generally just the principle, qiyas, right? So that's the principle used with with leadership in general. So I would just extend that qiyas to uh, khilaf as well, since that's used for the general for Imam generally. So, Rada, do you affirm that Ali radiallahu an gave bayah to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an? In taqiyya, yes. In taqiyya, okay. Is there okay? So all right. So now now that we get into this taqiyya thing, so. First off, is there not a valid opinion that if the Imam does something in Taqiyah, then even that hukam that he establishes in Taqiyah is a valid hukam? If that is all you know, yes. But if that is if you come later to if you come to know later that that is Taqiyah and that the Imam's actual ruling is something else, then you should follow what the actual ruling is. Right. So how do we know that it was in Taqiyah? Because we have. Uh, a multitude of hadith from later imams and also attributed to Imam al-Islam which uh, expressed the exact opposite like the sermon of Sheikh Shaqiyah is an example where Imam al-Islam is very uh, like openly talking negatively about Abu Bakr, Omar and Uthman and how they usurped the Khilafah from him so if this is one position for which we have a lot of support and we also know that Rasulullah appointed him and that the Khilafah was usurped from him. And on the other hand, we have a, one statement which contradicts this. Which statement do we put more weight on? How do you preclude the possibility of infinite, infinite regress taqiyya, right? So even the evidence that you just cited, how do I know that's not taqiyya? Okay, so do you believe there's a qat'i, like clear-cut way of determining whether or not Imam Ali gave the bay'ah in taqiyya? The clear cut way is is that in no, I'm not, it's just a yes or no question. Is, is there a clear cut way yes. or not? Yes. Yes, there is. Okay. So isn't the whole point of taqiyya to confuse the opponent, right? So that they, they're not able to decipher what the truth is, right? They're they're not able to uncover your true intentions. Yes or no? Yes. 
Yes. So if there's a clear cut way, how can there also be ambiguity such that your opponent does not know what you're saying? I feel like there's a contradiction there. Because there being a clear cut way to the people who uh, know and are on the side of truth does not mean that it cannot uh, deceive the opponent. So, so I agree with you, right? The people who witnessed Ghadir, right? Supposedly, if 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 Ghadir proves what you believe it proves, then for them to to then witness this charade Taqiyah show, that would you know clearly expose Taqiyah. Question for you now: the people who gave who gave bayah to Abu Bakr and Umar and witnessed Ali and gave the narrations of Ali uh, giving bayah to Abu Bakr and Umar, were they witness to Ghadir or were they absent from Ghadir? This, most of the Sahaba were present at Khadir. Correct. So, so, so everyone there, right? A hundred thousand, according to some narrations, up to two hundred thousand. I think one hundred forty thousand people, uh, Sahaba, witnessed Ghadir. Did he trick the one hundred forty thousand people, or did he not trick them? Ali, did he trick them or not? Like, were they convinced of Taqiyya? What, what was their opinion? Did, did they know about Taqiyya or not? People in power were satisfied with him in that they thought that they no longer have a threat from him, and the other people were not concerned in that they their their government their government is there with Abu Bakr and uh, if Allah Islam gives bi'ah, I mean Abu Bakr is the ruler regardless. No, no, it's just yes or no. Were they aware that this was this bi'ah was given in Taqiyya, or were they not aware of that? Some people were must have been aware. Some people, many people, were not aware. So some were aware, some, but I thought the criteria for determining if they were aware or not was if they witnessed Ghadir. People who witnessed Ghadir, uh -huh. many of them denied or distorted the event of Ghadir uh, in order to uh, support the legitimacy of Abu Bakr. Right, but they, but they knew in their hearts, they knew in their hearts that Ali was the true successor. So, so they knew that Ali's bayah was given in Taqiyya. Sure. Okay, so then what's the point of doing taqiyya? If everyone knows that you're doing taqiyya, like, isn't that kind of defeat purpose? The point, the point is he's no longer in threat because the khalifa, the, the quote-unquote khalifa, Abu Bakr, no longer views him as a threat. Since Did you not? Sure. Bayah, Go ahead. Now that he's given bayah, he's no longer a threat because he's not openly agitating against Abu Bakr. He's not in secret agitating against Abu Bakr. <laughs> There's there's no more threat to Abu Bakr's legitimacy. So for for him, that's all he wanted. Okay, so so Ali basically was lying to the. So your belief is that he was doing taqiyya, and from their perspective, they all knew that they, he was lying, and they all just kind of went along with the game because well, as long as Abu Bakr's Khalifa, you know. So it was just it was basically a game. Like he's kind of, and Ali was obviously. I mean, you don't believe he's stupid, while well, Ali about that, right? So he knew that they knew that he was lying, and it was just a game for everyone, basically. Why did Abu Bakr want his bayah in the first place? In order to legitimize his own reign and in order to remove the threat from Mama Isa. No, but nothing. Both, both, okay. both of those things happened by him giving the bayah and taqiyah, so he was satisfied with it. He doesn't but need. Nothing. He doesn't need to know a Mama Isa's heart is in is in this. He truly wants to give bayah to me sincerely. Like that doesn't make a difference to him whatsoever.